great job of leading us through a passage in the book of Titus talking about how in our church family we can not only survive through the generations, but we can actually thrive through uh, all the different generations that we have in the same room at the same time. And I think this morning's been an example of that. It's been so awesome, like Tony said, to see the kids up here singing and then to, to see uh, uh, Dave and Terry sing. In fact, I, I watched Dave sing and I'm like, how does that sound come out of that guy? I'm not quite sure. But uh, thanks for not breaking out into dance, though, because I would have had to have all afternoon to recover from that. Uh, but, uh, but it's been a great example today of how all of us can, can be part of a church family and be part of this together. Well, today, I want to turn our attention more towards our families outside of church, our, our immediate families and our extended families. Uh, God has been wrestling with me pretty hard over the last week or so getting ready for today along the ideas of expectations. And that's what I want to explore here a little bit today uh, because I think as human beings we have a natural tendency to place high expectations on people around us and probably most of us place the most expectations on the person who stares back at us in the mirror every morning. We expect a lot out of that person. And I see this play out uh, a lot, in a lot of different areas. I see this in people who are new to church a lot, uh, new Christians. You know, they come on board and, and they're new to everything, and so they set the bar high. They, they want the pace to be quick. So I see a lot of people, they'll make a, a goal to say, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to read the Bible in a year. You know what? Forget that. I'm going to read the Bible in a month. And, and they take off and they get through Genesis and Exodus and they're flying along pretty well. And then about three weeks in, you see them and they got this glazed look on their face. And you want to say, oh, you found Leviticus, didn't you? Because that's how it goes. We set the bar high. We go, 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 go. And then it's just natural tendency to, to fall off of that. That's always been true. It will always be true. It's always been true. Even, I found some evidence, even back to the very first man, Adam. I think he fell into this trap of setting his expectations high and not being able to keep the pace. And I, I've done a little CSI investigation on this, and I want you just to follow along this train of thought. Uh, even before Eve came along, Adam got his very first job, okay? And it's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, right before Eve was created. So Adam's by himself, which is all the animals and everything else on the planet, God gives him his first job. It's going to be on the side screen that says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. So you can see it, can't you? I mean, this is a big job. Think about that. That God has created all these animals, all these birds, all this stuff, but he didn't name them. And he says, Adam, come here, here's, here's, the, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give, I'm going to line them all up, and then you're going to name them all, and whatever you call them, that's what they're going to be from here on out. And you can almost see Adam. I mean, he is on it. He's like, yes, I, I got this. I'm all about this. So he lines them all up, and on day one, you can see he has set the bar high. He is creative. He's thinking outside the box. He, he is firing on every cylinder. He's like, day one, orangutan. I like that one. Orangutan. Uh, Salaman. I like, I like that one. Tarantula. Anaconda. Hippopotamus. Look at hippopotamus. I am flying. You know, he's just flying through one animal after another. Day one goes like that all day long. Day two, though, you can see him start to back off. Day two, he's fallen into a routine a little bit. Day two, he's more tired. You can see him go, uh, uh, monkey, uh, turkey, donkey, I, I don't know, I'm going to run. Uh, hog, frog, dog, parrot, ferret, I don't know, I, I'm running out. God, help me out. There's more animals. He, he's, he's running out of gas. By day three, by day three, you can see Adam is just out. Day three comes along and Adam's like, Cow? I don't know. Ox? That's all I got. But by day three, he's so desperate on day three, he just starts naming them whatever they're doing. And he's like, fly. I don't know, fly. You're, that's what you're doing. That's what you Grasshopper. Grasshopper. That's what you do. That's what you're going to get called. But you can see this. He starts off strong, and it starts to 
follow up. Now you may be saying, Brian, what's this have to do with this family matters topic? Well, for the next few moments, I'm going to take a walk on some thin holiday season ice. And I want you to walk with me a little bit. And I need for you to hang in with me for the next 15 minutes as I take you through this stream of consciousness that I've had about this topic. There's a scripture in John chapter 15. And it says this, between 12 and 17, it says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Then he goes on in verse 17 to say, this is my command. It's not an option. This is my command. Love each other. Now hang on to that. Remember that command for where we get to here in a little bit. There is a great holiday movie that comes on about this time every year, and they replay it a lot, called It's a Wonderful Life. How many of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life? Great movie. No matter how old or young you are, you've either seen the whole movie or you've seen bits and pieces of the movie. It's a phenomenal story. And then at the end of it, if you know the story at all, the main character, George Bailey, who's gone through this experience of feeling like maybe his life's fallen apart on him. You talk about the water level. George Bailey's water level gets right to his bottom lip. But at the end of the story, there's this great scene where all the pieces of his life come together in one spot at one time. Not just his immediate family, but the entire collection. The, 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 the business people he knows. The neighbors that he knows. His family, his extended family. They all come together in one spot at one time. And George Bailey gets to see up live and personal my life is full, I am indeed rich. And I think it's true that if you have a healthy mix of all of that, church friends, close family members, neighbor friends, little league friends, business friends, and you know that you can count on those, you are indeed a wealthy person. But as I've been in church work for the last 25 years, I've noticed a dynamic that seems to be growing, increasing as time goes along. So I want to talk for a moment about your family, about who many of you will be spending this next week at Thanksgiving with. When I say family, I'm talking about aunts and uncles. I'm talking about if you're grown, your, your adult brother or sisters, their children, your, your nieces and nephews, moms and dads and in-laws. I'm going to take you down what might be an uncomfortable track here for a few minutes, but I ask that you would hang with me until I get through it. I want to ask you a couple questions. Question one is this. I want you to think through your family, your immediate and extended family, the people that you'll be spending these next holidays with. And I want to ask you this. If you were not related by blood, if you were not related by blood, and these people treated you exactly the way that they currently treat you. Would you be friends with them? I don't want your answer. Okay? Somebody might be watching you right now. So just, just inside your head. Would that be true with your adult brothers and sisters? Who maybe you only see a couple times a year. If you were just two people that live next door to each other and not related by blood, would you hang out? Would you be friends? Or with your in-laws? Or their kids? And I know this is a tough question, but if you have grown children, if you have grown children and they treated you the exact way that they do now, would you want to invite them over for the holidays? Here's question number two. How many of you, if you were completely honest, would not choose to spend Thanksgiving with that group of people? If you could choose, question number three is, why do you? I know the reaction, because this is the reaction I gave when I first heard this, but what, 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 you got it, right? What, what you're supposed to, that's the rule. It's over the hills and through the hills to grandma's house we go. That's what we do at Thanksgiving. We're going to get together. We're going we're gonna to eat a lot. We're going to watch some football. Grandpa's going to take a nap. And, and we're going to have fun, doggone it, because that's what we do with the holidays. It's a rule, but the question I want to ask is, who made that rule? Now, hold on. Before you throw a fruitcake at me or a green bean casserole, just hang on with me. Because I'm not suggesting what you might think I'm suggesting. Just hang on for a few minutes. See, last 
year, the week before Thanksgiving, I, I listen to talk radio a lot. I'm, I'm kind of a boring dude in my private life. I listen to a lot of talk radio, and I like to listen to a guy named Glenn Beck. And on a morning show, Glenn Beck was talking about this very issue. All of his callers before Thanksgiving were calling in, and they were stressed out because they were getting ready to go home. And, and it didn't quite fit in, you know, it was going to cost them money, it was going to cost them time, and they were asking this question, why are we doing this? So Glenn Beck, in his natural argumentative style, he was saying, he picked up on this, he said, why do we do this? Why do we, why do we do this? So let me give a little disclaimer right now. I need you to hear this, okay? This section that we're talking about today, this topic, is not for those of you who have close, healthy, open family relationships. If you have that, you have been extremely blessed. You have a model that inspires the rest of us, frankly. So hang on to that. Keep your expectations high in that setting. Tell your kids how you feel about them, because I promise you, it doesn't matter how old you get. It doesn't matter where you're at in life. It's still important to hear mom and dad say, I'm proud of you, I love you, I want to know what's going on in your life. So if you have that in your life, Hang on to that. But as I've watched for the last 20 years being a pastor, the depression rate skyrocket between the, the, the month of November and December. You know that that's the highest time for depression in our country is between Thanksgiving and Christmas? There's something behind that. What, what is there? What's causing all that to happen? Because, you know, for some of us, this season is not It's a Wonderful Life. Because some of us don't have healthy, open communication or relationships. For some of us, there is tension at best and dysfunction at worst. And the holiday season, this, this highly amplified month, seems to, anticipate, to, to amplify that so that by January, that water level did not drop. The water level just rose. So anyway, this radio show was flooded with callers who were, who were awkward admitting that it was very hard for them to call in and admit, but it seemed that they were kind of relieved to finally admit that, you know what, it's hard. I do it, and I, and I will always do it, but I, I want to be honest with you, it's a little hard. So many of them said it's tense and it's awkward, and they drive back home, and they fly back home, and they're more exhausted than they were before the trip. And why is that? Well, I think, I think that for whatever reason, we have created an expectation level that is different from reality. We're expecting more of these relationships.